Even if there are companies writing documentation, I didn't see a really strategic approach to figuring out which problems to solve, what their audience wants, and actually treating documentation as a form of content marketing, as a way to build an audience and turn that audience or some of your audience into paid subscribers. I do think a lot of the anxiety about the state of a company's documentation comes from the unknown unknowns. They know what they have has value, but it's almost like, um, this is the worst analogy in the world, but I'll try. It's like the way that we used to talk about data or oil. Once it's in the ground, you can't really use it if it hasn't been cleaned and processed. I welcome Portia Burton to the API The Dog podcast today. Hi, and very, very warmest welcome. I'm very happy that we could meet today. And uh, this is also a special occasion because usually the guests on this podcast are people I know or the people I know know. But with Portia, we are actually complete strangers to each other. So Portia asked me like, hey, so how did you think of inviting me? And I told you that I'm going to tell this to you while we're recording. So it's a surprise. It was love at first LinkedIn post. I read your post about workplace communication and... Yeah, I was like, I, we got to talk, although not necessarily about that, but about API documentation and documentation, but uh, still. So this is how I invited you, and I'm very happy that you accepted this. So welcome. Yeah, thank you for having me here. And I'm, I'm glad that, you know, you put all this stuff on LinkedIn and on Twitter, and you never know who's reading. So it's always nice to know that there are folks who actually read and consider the stuff that you're creating. What did we say again? Documentation and a technical writing management group, which is invitation only for dogs, folks. Uh, but it's a growing group and, and, and I like the things that you're posting there. You were posting there as the founder of Document Write, but there's a long road to there. So when we started uh, talking here um, and then we quickly started recording was when we got into the heat of, okay, so how did you spend seven years in China and why is your Mandarin so good? Tell me a little bit about yourself. Also, like we're kind of getting to know each other here. And what brought you to documentation? And as far as I understand, you're mostly involved in content audits. But what's the journey that leads there? How, how did you start? Sure. Well, in terms of our company, uh, Document Write, we do content audits, we write documentation, and we also do um, UX audits as well. So, but getting to the original question, it's a long road, but I think for many technologists, it's a long road. So I graduated with a degree in biological anthropology, and I was on my way of getting a PhD. It just felt like life was be life was just really, um, it was like an A, B, C constant progression that I felt like I didn't have a lot of control in. And so I'm like, oh, well, let me just shake things up and spend like six to seven months doing this uh, ESL internship in uh, China. ESL, uh-huh. So that's how you got there. Yeah, that's how I got there. I met this guy named John and he told me about this uh, job, this ESL job in a university. So I applied to it. But the person who interviewed me, she thought that I was talking about another John, but it was already oh. too late. And she hired me and I was actually an ESL teacher at a university for about three or four years. And during that time period, I actually got into Linux. So when I was living in China, I could, in the town I was living in, this is not true for all Chinese cities back then, but I could not find a legal copy of Microsoft. So mm -hmm. all of the copies of Microsoft were bootleg. They had um, viruses in them, spyware, and I couldn't get a legal copy if I wanted to. And so that's how I got into Ubuntu. And I bought a Nano, a Lenovo Nano, and I spent my afternoons putting weird di different distributions of Linux on my computer, be it Ubuntu, be it a uh, little Ubuntu I had, which is like a light Ubuntu. But I finally stopped with um, Mint. So Mint was pretty cool. And I used Mint for a couple of years. So I was like a big Linux head for like two or three years, but I didn't, 
I didn't realize there were other people who were in Linux and Ubuntu. So I, I didn't know this until I was dating someone in China and they were like, Hey, you're into Linux. You know, there are other people in the Linux. I'm like, what? They're like, yeah, they get together and they just talk about software. And I'm like, that is super cool. So he took me to this meetup. And so this guy, he, um, he's a software developer. And then I was surrounded by software developers and I just had the time of my life. We would just talk about these different problems and such. And I come from a very like a liberal arts anthropology background. And a thing that made these conversations different at, uh, I was at the Beijing Linux meetup. And what made these uh, conversations different is we would talk about a problem. And then at the end, the person came up with the solution. This was the first time where we, the people experiencing the problem, we were able to make a difference. And that blew my mind and that was just really inspiring. And then from there, I was kind of getting tired of ESL. I was hanging out with these software developers. So I was like, oh, hey, maybe I could become a software developer. So I spent about nine or 10 months just uh, teaching myself the basics of Python. Then I finally moved back to the United States. Um, I was living in Portland. And because of my background in Mandarin and because I knew the basics of Python, I was able to land a machine learning internship. This was which year? Oh boy, you're, you're going to date me. Oh, okay. This was the end of 2012. <laughs> I mean, no, you just said machine learning, so I have to ask. Yeah, um, slightly different from what we're looking at. Like it definitely, definitely weren't conversations about open, a, uh, open AI because open AI didn't exist in 2012. It was a lot about the uh, scikit-learn it was a lot about uh, data analysis with like pandas. And so I actually, if you dig really deep into my GitHub, I actually have a pandas course that I made. And I also gave some presentations in PyCon about getting started with like machine learning with Python. But that was, wow, that was about 10 years ago. <laughs> I started my first company which is called PLB analytics, because I'm like, I spent a whole year learning machine learning, learning about machine learning and analytics. And I thought it was going to be, I thought it was a waste for me not to professionally use it. And so that's when I started PLB analytics. Uh, the company was a complete failure. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's just, oh, laugh, this is please laugh. <laughs> Evergreen story of every entrepreneur ever. I started my second company, which was about, which was blockchain consulting. Long story short, that failed. And during that time that I was building this like blockchain consultancy company, I was living in Mexico city and I was applying for jobs. And so I applied this company called Slocket and it was really cool. So they worked with blockchain and they also worked with um, microcontrollers like Arduino. So they were making like, huh. yeah. So they were like making these machines that were like popping popcorn. Um, they had an Airbnb in Germany that was connected to, that had an Ethereum node. Um, and so I applied to this company. I totally didn't think I was gonna get the job. It was like my dream company and I'm like, they contacted me say, Hey, what, we'll give you like a test. I did it. I'm like, they're totally not going to hire me. And they did. And so they're based in Midvida. And so I went from Mexico city to East Germany. Long story short, I was able to go to Berlin, a Silicon Valley company who was also doing blockchain stuff said, Hey, do you want to work with, do you want to work with us? I changed to that other company and I was doing, I was a community community engineer. Take that title as you will. <laughs> community engineer, meaning you worked in community forming as an engineer? Great question. So community engineer is really just another name for developer advocate. As a developer advocate, I was educating people about the different decentralized tools out there, such as like IPFS and showing them like how they can get started. And I would like give talks and conferences and such. And um, I did a lot of presentations. So yeah, I was basically a developer advocate. 
I don't know if this was the reason, but I'm starting to see a connection of why you're devoted to good documentation coming from the <laughs> blockchain technologies. Uh, there's not a lot of documentation over there or always outdated. Where did the idea of having your own consultancy on content audits and UX audits come? And does that mean that you're more specialized towards uh, decentralized technologies? You ask such good questions. In the beginning, yes. In the beginning, we worked with a lot of decentralized um, companies, but getting companies that specialize in decentralized technologies, but getting back to like your previous comment, yes. So working in blockchain, we had all these different technologies. And so the engineers were really enthusiastic about building like different protocols and building different, in certain cases, different applications. But no one bothered to explain it to the rest of us. And this wasn't just a problem I saw on blockchain. Like, man, this was a problem that I experienced even back in my Linux days. It feels like during my whole time in tech, there's this real hostility towards like education or teaching or learning. And even when I went to a lot of tech meetups, there was just a lot of pressure to seem really smart and not be vulnerable about the stuff that you didn't know. And what it means is that there are a bunch of people who were shy about asking questions, who didn't really, who just had these gaps of knowledge that just, they just carried with them for years because of this taboo of learning, teaching, taking a step back, asking why. I don't know if I'm in an echo chamber, I like a cultural echo chamber, but it feels to me that this is not so much the case anymore, or that somehow the tide has changed in the, the even outside of documentation circles, the value of good how to use this thing and why should I use it anyway kind of documentation is a good thing. Now, I don't know how the tide is going to change once more when there's too much documentation out there. I completely agree with you. Like, I think we did a 180 in terms of the respect of documentation and the respect that we have for technical educators. In 2019, I kept seeing this theme, this gap. Like, there are many companies out there, let's put like AWS, where there are developers making products for developers but no one wrote the documentation. And there was a logical reason why no one like is writing the documentation because the documentation I think is a form of content marketing for nerds. It's helpful for the company, but it's not helpful for anyone's career. Like if you are a software developer, in most cases, you're not going to get a promotion because you wrote documentation. You're gonna get a promotion because you created a feature. And so it felt like there was this problem that was, n that was not being addressed internally for many companies. And that's how I came up with uh, document, right? Because we go in to companies, we write the documentation. We no, first of all, we figure out what's the problem that we're trying to solve, what the company has already tried, and then what, what's the stuff that the audience like want, what's the stuff that they want to do? What are the goals they want to accomplish? And even if there are companies writing documentation, I didn't see a really strategic approach to figuring out which problems to solve, what their audience wants, and actually treating documentation as a form of content marketing, as a way to build an audience and turn that audience or some of your audience into paid subscribers. Because I know personally, that's been my process as well. Like when I was doing all this stuff in like Portland and when I was um, in DC, my life was documentation. Like I went home in the weekends and I read how to make, how to plot stuff using like Plotly and Pandas. I learned how to make applications on Ethereum. Like I learned all this because, I, because of documentation. In certain cases, I went from just a user 
to a subscriber. I actually went through this funnel myself and I just think it's an untapped resource in terms of growing tech companies, specifically dev tool companies. Where is the point where an external auditor is good to be called in? And what would be the situation in which this is not a simple, okay, let's outsource it to someone because we don't want to do it, but it's a more complex, oh my gosh, we don't even know where to start with this. We digged ourselves so deep that we don't know how to find our way out. I got to be honest. I'm always shocked how willing people are for us to do a content audit. <laughs> I actually expect more pushback, but I do think a lot of the anxiety about the state of a company's documentation um, comes from the, the unknown unknowns. Mm -hmm. Many companies know that they have problems that they haven't uncovered yet. Many companies want a way forward where they can see what are some of the opportunities that they're missing in their documentation. Like they know what they have has value, but it's almost like, um, this is the worst analogy in the world, but I'll, I'll try. It's like the way that we used to talk about data or oil. Like once it's in the ground, you can't really use it if it's, if it hasn't been cleaned and processed and it's very similar, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship, but it's very similar to documentation. Like in order to make it more useful for the future, you need to like go in, dive in and analyze what do you have? What are your traffic patterns? Um, are people getting the information that they need? So web analytics is slightly different in documentation if someone um, is spending not as much time on a page that could mean that they already got their answer and just knowing what's important. Or if you have a blog post that people are spending conversely, if you have a blog post that people are spending more time on, maybe they're interested in it and maybe, uh, you should create more content and just like, know or knowing what you have, I can't tell you how many companies are relieved that they have an inventory of the resources, the documentation they have, and it's ordered, what exactly do they have a getting started guide? Do they have, what does their API documentation look like? What are some of the problems? So I think, so an audit brings clarity and I'm always surprised like how our clients understand that an audit will help them get to that, that golden place of clear, responsive, and helpful documentation. There's a lot of enthusiasm and understanding of, okay, we, we got to understand what we have and what we don't have, right? But then there's this dip usually on such roads. Where is the dip in this journey? Speed's important. And you get speed when you have full, when you're having full resources and when you have full, I don't want to use the word authority, to go into the documentation. So the thing with us is that's all we do. So we don't have any competing jobs. Like we're not, we're not writing code or features. We're not um, doing like analytics for the site in general. And so we have less of that pressure because we are brought in specifically to deal with a documentation problem. So that's one. And number two, we work quickly. So most of our audits are done within two weeks. And mm -hmm. yeah, and I think the killer of documentation projects is like how much time it takes and the fact that you can't time box it. And so we, based on of our previous experience, we try to time box it. Uh, we do time box it and we do the audit as quickly as possible so that we can get to the juice or the meat of our services, which is actually writing fresh documentation or creating automation systems. Tell me about some hard problems that you've seen when you did an audit. We just have a, such a set system that we haven't, we don't have so many hard problems because we know what we're supposed to do. Meaning we know we need to give you an inventory. We know we need to grade the accessibility of your documentation. We know we need to look 
at your instructions and make sure they actually work. And for 99% of our clients, we're doing this so that we can get to the next step, which is actually writing documentation. I would say we don't have any like um, bumps in the road in terms of an audit, if that makes sense. Is there advice that you you yourself uh, believe is the way to go today uh, when it comes to API docs? But it feels counterintuitive to those who own these docs or uh, it's a hard sell. I think internally what we do is a hard sell. Like for us, once a company hires us, then we do have a certain amount of buy-in. But I think for people who write API documentation, the hardest thing to do is to have that buy-in. Like it's really hard to justify well, why are we spending half an hour talking about docs every other week? Why are you putting Veil in when you can be building new features for us? Or why are we, or why is there one person who's accountable for documentation? Why do we need to put systems in? Why do we need to interview our users? And I think if you are, if you don't have access to hiring a company, the most important thing for you to do is to show what bad documentation is doing for your company. Like, how is it holding it back? Show a really clear path forward. So instead of saying, I don't know how long this would take, really do try to make sure that this takes like two weeks or so or a month. Um, do the research. I know it is really hard internally to get the buy-in and do the research, but you really... There's a amount of confidence that I think a lot of companies don't have in their documentation. And that lack of confidence comes from not talking to their end user and not being able to know how valuable the documentation is and not being able to show what problem the documentation is solving. So doing that upfront research just gives you the kind of confidence and buy-in that you would not receive if you didn't go out there and find users and talk to them. A closing question from me. Um, some days ago, I read a post from Chris McDermott, who is uh, known in the Agile community, uh, but he uh, so he does a lot of consulting around uh, practices and maturity modeling. And he wrote that recently he notices that a lot of the consulting they need to give, a lot of the work they need to help is to kind of undo the damages of practices that were developed during the lockdown periods. And that was interesting because in most I have usually heard positive things as in as new practices that were developed in the lockdown periods, because it was kind of an auditing moment for our processes and lives. Like, okay, do we still want to keep going into the office? Nope. But so that was an interesting counterintuitive remark from Chris. And I wonder if you experienced something similar that new practices, new habits around documentations or documentation processes or needs were shaped that are once again, not up to date. Yes. Have a process. <laughs> Seriously, many of the folks we work with, and they know this, this is not a big secret. Document is random. <laughs> Document is a random event. Like documentation happens when people have time and most of the time people don't have time. And so I would say the best thing you can do is have a process. Um, if you are trying to jumpstart good documentation practices in your company, don't be too ambitious. Just have like a Friday, three o'clock in the afternoon, and just bribe people with like donuts. <laughs> not everyone's gonna <laughs> like not everyone's gonna like this advice, but I think this is a good start. <laughs> and make it documentation day. Or make it uh, review the documentation you already have day, or take a time. I don't know, if you need to get off of work at five, this is, I know this is if you work in an office and it's four o'clock, make that documentation time as well. Like just try to find these little uh, periods of time and meet on a regular basis and then take it from there. 
and try to have metrics. Like, what do you want your documentation to do? How do you know your, do your efforts are successful? And how do you know that you should pivot? And I think um, th that's where you can begin. And I know we are trying to create, haha, -ha, plug. We have a lot of these resources on our YouTube channel and we are creating even more resources on how to write and how to maintain excellent documentation in your mm -hmm. company. Besides do have a process, um, is there a specific other message you would like to, to leave the audience with? Yeah, um, I think technical writers have a civic duty to put more information out there about the products, the products that they're working on. So I have been in the crypto world. I'm just AI curious. And there's just so much like misinformation out there. Or there are reporters where they're generalist, so they don't know some of the details of what you're working on. And I just think it's important for technical writers and developers to take that hat and take that role of being public educators and sharing your knowledge with others so that we can all move forward in an empowered and informed way. Wow, fully agree. Well said. Thank you. <laughs> I hope a lot of people hear this. Thank you very much. This was an amazing conversation and I hope that we can continue it in person at any corner of the world anytime soon. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so Thank much you for having me. Pleasure. Thank you for listening to the API The Docs podcast. We thank our colleagues at Pronovis Developer Portals for letting us work on this, and the entire API community for all of the mutual support and sharing of experiences that you give each other. Do you have a topic or guest that you would like us to spotlight? Drop a note at podcast at pronovix.com. If you go to the website, api.docs.org, you can find the recaps and recordings of past API Docs conferences, as well as the upcoming program. Until next time, be well. <laughs>